Welcome to the Nathan Crane Podcast, your number one source for everything holistic health. Listen to guest interviews with top doctors and health experts and discover cutting edge solutions for living your healthiest, longest, and most fulfilling life. There's never been a better time to become healthier, happier, and more alive. And now your host, best-selling author, inspirational speaker, and cancer health researcher and educator, Nathan Crane. Hello and welcome everybody. I am super excited about this podcast today with Dr. Joel Furman, a good friend and colleague, a seven-time New York Times bestselling author, and one of the rare medical doctors who actually helps people not only prevent chronic diseases like heart disease and diabetes and cancer, but actually helps them transform their lifestyle to help their bodies heal themselves from these chronic diseases. And he has significant results, um, and he's been helping many people all over the world for decades. So, um, Dr. Joel Furman, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Nathan. Great to be here. So you primarily focus on, well, you really uh, created something called the Nutritarian Diet, and it is primarily focused on a whole food plant-based diet, right? Some would call it a vegan diet, but you wouldn't necessarily call it a vegan diet. Can you talk about that? Right. I mean, particularly my interest is in reversing disease and making the, um, putting forth the science and the clinical evidence that nobody has to have a heart attack or a stroke. We can reverse those illnesses, reverse diabetes, get them off people, off the medications, and even reverse autoimmune diseases like psoriasis and, and rheumatoid arthritis and Sjogren's syndromes and lupus so is reversible. And I've spent my life aiding people in reversing those conditions. So we're talking about the diet style that's most favorably designed to slow the aging process, prevent disease, prevent cancer and dementia, and also reverse disease. So what I'm saying is the nutritarian diet is designed as where is the scientific evidence point that what portfolio of foods will allow people to age slowly, slowest as possible, live the longest, and then can you utilize that longevity promoting diet style as a therapeutic tool to reverse disease in people who may be sick and be suffering with various chronic conditions. And so that's predominantly what, what the Nutritarian Diet is about. And it's based on various principles. And one of the main principles is give the most nutritional bang per caloric buck and have both a high level of nutrient exposure while at the same time having a broad diversity of exposure to a wide variety of nutrients that humans need, not leaving any particular um, hole open, making sure you have every nutrients humans need in the right amount and with the, with the knowledge and the science to know that most Americans and most people in the modern world are ubiquitously and severely deficient in phytochemicals. And we're an animal with a high phytochemical requirement and exposure to the, the density and variety of phytochemicals is the secret to slowing aging and preventing cancer. So, there are a lot of health experts out there who would agree with you and a lot of others who don't agree with you. And I think this is the confusing part of the internet today is there is science that supports absolutely everything you say. And then there's science that people reference that uh, they say claims the opposite. So what, what I'm interested in, especially with this podcast and all the work that I do and the work I've done for almost two decades now is really researching and understanding what is the truth, what is the diet, the lifestyle, the, the most effective things we can do and ways we can live and eat that promote health and vitality and longevity uh, with the least amount of disease and the least amount of health problems possible, right? And I know that's been your focus for a very long time. So how do, how do you look at science of nutrition um, and why is what you're teaching controversial and compared to what maybe others are saying out there? Right. I mean, you have a lot of people that put forth their opinions, but I don't think that this scientific information is controversial among nutritional scientists and scholars in this field. In other words, people who spend their life studying the 
the um, the world's um, nutritional science literature and its complete um, availability and knowledge we've collected over the last 20 years. Um, we don't have much controversies among nutritional scientists, nutritional science meetings, you know, lifestyle medicine conferences, the World Health Organization meetings on nutrition. In other words, in the field of nutritional science, there's been less and less controversy and more coming together of knowledge with so much corroborating evidence so that we can grade evidence based on a grad on a system of grading. And we know that, for example, that the most proven methodology to slow aging and extend human lifespan, and I want people to write down these five words because all the evidence points to this, and that, that is moderate caloric restriction because we know that being overweight shortens lifespan, even being 30 pounds overweight shortens lifespan. So moderate caloric restriction to maintain a, a low body mass and a low body fat mass. And we're talking here about maintaining your body fat below 25% if you're a female and below 15% if you're a male. So very clear and precise about that. In the context of nutritional excellence. So we're talking about achieving nutritional excellence without consuming excess calories moderate caloric restriction, not severe caloric restriction, because severity of caloric restriction leading to anorexia could lead to nutritional deficiencies and low muscle and low body mass. And, you know, we're taking things in your immune system too far. So that's the foundational principle there. And then we're talking about, we'll talk about other factors that adjust lifespan, but essentially we're looking at three categories of food here. One category is processed foods. And those are things like pasta, bread, salad oil, mayonnaise, donuts, cookies, crackers, rice cakes, breakfast bars, give us sources of calories without a significant micronutrient load. And the micronutrients do not contain calories like phytochemicals and antioxidants and vitamins and minerals are not calories, they're just nutrients. The calories are, the three calorie containing nutrients are fat, carbohydrate, and protein. And we know that most people shorten their lifespan because they're eating too many calories, too much fat, too much carbohydrate, and too much protein. So we're trying to people eat less fat, less carbohydrate, less protein, lower their macronutrients, and increase their micronutrients by eating foods that have a, a higher micronutrient density, particularly of phyto, phytochemicals. So one thing we have here to start out with is that almost all the nutritional scientists in the world, and I'll say more than 95% of nutritional scientists in the world agree that processed foods, taking in empty calories, shortens human lifespan. And then we have one third of the American diet is animal products. And animal products are rich in protein and fat, but they don't really contain much carbohydrate, but they also do not contain phytochemicals and antioxidants. And if we use the 36 various parameters set for us by the government on the RDIs for nutrients, we find that animal products are relatively low in vitamins and minerals and particularly low in phytochemicals compared to plants. Plants, colorful plants are phytochemical rich and also rich in other vitamins and minerals, more like concentrated. Now, where the animal-based kind of doctors and people out there would, would disagree with that is in the diets they promote, they promote and their animal products is the uh, the things like the livers and the heart and the brains and those kinds of things of the animal, which are actually very high in a lot of those nutrients. So what uh, what are your thoughts on that? No, they're not. They're high in specific individual nutrients like niacin and, and beech. They have, in other words, they have a very select amount of nutrients they're high in. They're select, they're high in six particular nutrients, but low in diversity of nutrients and no antioxidants, no phytochemicals, and none of those anti-cancer factors we get from plants. What I'm saying right now, looking at that animal product, th those are theories. People start with a theory and they can have a theory that they or a hypothesis. And then we can look at short-term studies to see whether utilizing, let's say, more animal products in the diet or less leads to more further um, short-term benefits. And then we can look at long-term studies over the years to see if it has long-term benefits for lifespan. And we give more credence to studies that look at hard endpoints. So since you're bringing that up, I would say that the corroborating evidence is overwhelming today that, and this is from more than a thousand different studies today, that as diets go higher in animal products, we see more early life deaths of all cause mortality, meaning more heart attack deaths and more cancer deaths and more stroke deaths, except for hemorrhagic strokes. So we have to exclude Asian countries that have a lot of salt, 
where they're leading strokes for hemorrhagic strokes. And look at Western countries in the United States where our leading cause of strokes are ischemic strokes formed by clots. So we can talk about hemorrhagic strokes later. But right now, what I'm saying right now is that we give more credence to studies that have large numbers of people, hundreds of thousands of people enrolled, and go on for decades, because you have to follow people for decades to see the outcome. If I give you a vitamin or I give you a smoke cigarettes and track you for a couple of years, we're not going to see the overall effect. You may even lose weight from smoking cigarettes, and it may even make your triglycerides look down. It may help you with weight. It may, may have some beneficial effects. We know over the years, if you smoke for 30 years, you'd be at higher risk of a lot of different diseases. The point I'm making is, is that there's a difference between a soft endpoint, like you lost some weight or your glucose went down, or a hard endpoint which is you died you had an early life death, you got cancer, you had a heart attack. And I'm using the terms very carefully here to say all the long-term studies looking at heart endpoints, following large numbers of people to the end of their life to see how long they live. All those studies corroborate each other. And these are high credence, long-term studies of large numbers of people. And they all corroborate each other, showing that more animal protein and more animal products makes for more premature deaths, and a premature death is defined as the death before the age of 70, and more heart attacks, strokes, and cancers, and dementias. So we're saying that there's no controversy among nutritional scientists today that diets higher in animal products are unfavorable for longevity and are actually dangerous. Now, the question is, what about diets with a moderate amount of animal products? Or well, let's, let, of let's save that, because I want to get into that. But before we do... So here's where the controversy is that I've seen and where I'd like you to, to touch deeper on. And, and actually something I'm actually curious about myself, because sure. isn't, it, isn't it true that most, if not all of those studies, all that group together animal products and, and corroborate each other, right? Which is a lot of the research I've seen and actually read and looked at for the past you know, 15 plus years. Uh, which has led me into the path of, you know, a, a whole food plant-based diet. But now as I look deeper into it, aren't those, aren't majority, if not all of those studies, actually, um, they include all kinds of animal products, including, you know, milk, homogenized processed milk, um, things like fried bacon, things like uh, processed meats, which we know are carcinogenic, uh, lunch meats, these kinds of things, right? Versus, don't they include all the all kinds of those kinds of you know ha you know processed hamburgers from McDonald's, things that we know are toxic, and combine a lot of other toxic things together, versus looking at what a lot of you know the the kind of animal based movement that's happening right now, where they're saying, look, we don't recommend eating any of those things. We recommend eating you know just even raw liver and straight from the animal and this sort of thing. Right where they're they're promoting a totally different thing and saying, hey, those studies don't apply to this because none of those studies actually include this healthier animal diet that we promote. Um, so I'm curious about that and what you think about that. Yeah, it's a spurious argument. In other words, it's not. It's totally not true. Is that the scientists today are highly technical, very advanced in their ability to ferret, to ferret out different influences and controls. And that most of these studies are not done in, in the United States on, on the type of um, processed meats and commercial meats. Most of them are done in other countries where the meats are grass fed, raised naturally. In other words, when you have a thousand studies that corroborate each other, and the majority of which are done in countries where they're using um, natural raised animal products, it excludes that argument. Not only does it exclude that argument, it shows that, that the animal product consumption in America with commercially raised animal products has, is not anything is not any worse than the animal products that they're eating in um, New Zealand, which are all wild-based non-commercial animal products. You get the same negative effects from animal protein going up in the diet in New Zealand studies and Australian studies with using grass-fed and pasture-raised animals and wild animals as you do in America using commercial animal products. In other words, it's just a theoretical argument. Do you know where someone can look at those and, studies? And, that, and also that they are isolating, they're not studying processed meats. And the World Health Organization reviewed a thousand studies that are not studying diets high in processed meats. They're, and look at also the, yes, the Seventh-day Adventist study Seventh-day Adventist Health Study 2, for example, right. is, a, is a religious group in the United States where they advocate exercise, not smoking. 
not drinking alcohol, and eating relatively small amounts of clean animal products. And there, that study um, has gone on for more than 30 years now. And the reason why it has so much respect in the nutrition world is because we can compare people on diets that are largely health, healthy and are not eating a lot of junk food and are not eating bacon and, and hot dogs, but are eating animal products in small quantities. And what those studies have shown, which has been corroborated by other studies around the world too, is that even moderate amounts of animal products produces significant increased risk. Not only the diets richer in animal products, and I'm saying that we see this a dose dependent relationship between as you go above 10% of animal products, you start to see the risks climb significantly so that even 15 or 20% places people at significant risk and where genetics play more of a role. But once you go over 30 to 40% of calories from animal products, genetics have relatively little risk and the whole population develops usually heart disease and cancers, develops high, high rates of diseases. So we have um, significant studies from various isolated populations around the world that corroborate studies in major Western United States. And most of these studies are done, are not done in commercial raised animal products in America, but they are done in countries where they have more natural animal products. So I'm saying that argument is, is you know, you could say, well, we, people are eating other junk food. Yeah, you know, but so the studies are highly technical today, especially when you have, um, you know, a lot of these studies have 20, 30 scientists working on them. And they're working on these studies for decades, trying to look at those issues and ferret out exactly what the people are eating and actually determine the risks of various parts of the study. For example, what about the fish component? What about the dairy component? What about what about the processed meats? And what they found in those studies when they've evaluated the various types of animal products, they found that processed meats had the most definitive, have the most um, dangers for a cart for cancer. But red meats were also a class one A carcinogen. In other words, red meats also were severely, were strongly carcinogenic or cancer causing compared to let's say fish. And, but animal protein did play a role, especially in, in special up to the age of 70. In other words, in midlife, you could say from the age, you know, until the age of let's say 70 years old, reductions of animal protein seems to be a major factor in keeping IGF-1 in a hormonally favorable range that allows for slower aging. What I'm saying right now, one of the most controlling factors in reducing risk of cancer and slowing aging that's recognized by the world's nutritional science community is regulating IGF-1 to keep IGF-1 into a moderately safe range and not let it go too high. And, more, and diets higher in animal products, unquestionably, no matter where you get the animal product from, even fish, and even fish are, that expose us to microplastics today and other toxic chemicals from us dumping garbage in the water, but even fish and egg whites, which are somewhat safer forms of animal products, as you go in higher amounts to get the animal protein too high, you can push the IGF-1 over 200 and even over 250, which is associated with higher rates of cancer and shortens lifespan. The fact that animal protein to a degree regulates our rate at which we age and too much animal protein, as it goes up, it pushes IGF-1, which is a hormone associated with cellular replication that ages us and increases risk of cancer. And we want our IGF-1 in that sweet spot of not being too low or too high. And that later on in life for people over the age of 75 or 80, we wanna make sure we're getting adequate protein in the high protein plant foods, such as hemp seeds and green vegetables and beans and soybeans that are associated with longer lifespan. And that, but we, but in, in any case, what we're saying here, protein does matter, but most of these studies show that more plant protein in the diet leads to adequate but not excessive IGF-1 and more animal protein in the diet. As you go to a certain level of animal protein, it pushes IGF-1 into an unfavorable range, even if it's clean animal protein, such as egg whites or wild fishes. Um, so I'm saying that animal protein itself, even using something like um, isolated soy protein or whey or egg protein, or even, in, you know, a, a, we're talking about protein powders and drinks could also, it could maximize growth or maximize muscle mass, would not be most favorable for longevity. And we know the profession that has the shortest lifespan in North America 
are linebackers on football teams who are extra large and ate a diet to get that big. And so when you're eating a diet to get excessively large as a power lifter or as a linebacker on a football team, it would be good to, to keep your body fat low, not to go for such high degree of muscle mass and to try to relatively control calories so you don't get quite that large that you would need to, you would need to be a professional um, football player, a linebacker, or a football team, or a power lifter. So we're saying here that size is not the determinant of good health either. Hey, I just want to take a quick second and thank you for listening to this episode. I hope you're enjoying it so far. As a special thank you for tuning into this episode, I want to give you my number one Amazon best-selling book absolutely free. You can go download it right now at becomingcancerfree.com. If you want to learn evidence-based strategies for helping your body become a cancer-fighting machine for not only cancer reversal but cancer prevention, go grab a copy of the book. Again, I'm just giving it to you for free. You can go download it at becomingcancerfree.com. All right, let's get back to the show. Yeah, it goes back to what you were talking about, about moderate caloric restriction and, you know, the um, body fat, fifteen less than 15% for men, less than 25%. Also excessive um, muscle mass, which as the size of our body gets bigger, it to exceed the capacity of our organs to clean and to the heart to oxygenate. In other words, being too large and too much muscle mass could also age us faster. And that's also, I mean, you have to eat extra calories to get that big. And the extra calories run our furnaces at a higher degree of uh, at utilizing more, you could say, energy. And so we also control our metabolic rate. So when we eat excess calories, we speed up our metabolic rate and we undershoot our calories or eat, don't eat excess calories. It slows down our metabolic rate and our metabolic rate corresponds to the rate at which we're aging. Well, and that's, that's a trade-off for some people tuning in who are athletes or professional athletes or who are striving to be a professional athlete and they love what they do. They love their sport, gives them, you know, purpose and meaning and drive and joy in their life. Right. And on one, one hand, on one degree, it's very, you know, many of them today are living a, a very healthy lifestyle. And the fact that they really focus on, you know, adequate sleep every night and recovery and sauna and ice baths and massage and relaxation and eating a uh, clean diet in a lot of ways, cleaner than most people. Uh, I'm not talking about all athletes out there, but you know, a lot of the ones that I know, um, including myself and I go above and beyond. I think um, a lot of the people that I know, because I really care about not only my performance, but also longevity. And so I know there is a trade off there because of the, you know, the amount of food that you have to eat and the amount of digesting that you have to do, right? Isn't a big part of allowing the body to heal itself, to repair itself, to go into autophagy and help eliminate, you know, the, the cell, basically recycle and replenish the cellular waste of the cells to go eliminate cancer cells. A big part of that is not allowing the body to consistently put all of its energy and time on uh, digestion so it can go into healing, which is why, you know, we can talk about fasting also, the importance of, um, you know, having, whether it's time restricted eating or inter intermittent fasting or having some breaks between meals where this um, old paradigm of, hey, eat five, six, seven times a day, which means you actually are never taking a break away from digestion, except maybe when you sleep, is actually not the best thing to do for most people. Right. Um, so I want to go down both of those rabbit holes in a second. Before I do all these studies that you've been referencing, uh, I know you've looked at these and collected these. And where do you have them all listed? They're in one of your books or in all of your books, right? Right. I, I do have more than 30,000 scientific studies that I've collected over the years that I've, you know, I've spent my life reading these studies. And I have, have you to... read all 30,000 of them? Yes. Wow. Carefully that's, over that's years, 30,000. And I'm saying that difference from, from people saying that studies all contradict each other, they all show different things. It's not true. The overwhelming amount of evidence points to the same direction on all the studies on nutritional science and longevity. And I have to say that um, in my most recent book, which is called Eat for Life, and I'm mentioning the most recent book because it has the most updated references and also the most references in it. And so there's over 2,000 references in the book um, going into all these factors in detail. And, and when people look at the references, they can see that the references support what I'm saying in the paragraph with multiple studies supporting each statement. I, I read nutritional and health books 
that give a reference, and I'm not going to mention names of people who wrote them, but you pull the reference that's referenced to support the statement, and the reference didn't even have data to support the statement that was claimed. I've actually seen that exact same thing on blog posts or different things that I've read, and I go in and look at the citations, yep. and I read it, and I'm and I'm and I've seen that sometimes where it literally either doesn't support what they're saying at all, or even in some cases it's like the opposite. Or I'm like, what is this? How is this a citation for what you're claiming? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then let me clarify what you said about athletes because. Um, I think that look at like, um, you know, Novik Djokovic, the tennis player, the top tennis players in the world, Federer, Djokovic, and Murray, look at these guys, they all eat super healthy, they all eat nutritarian, what's almost essentially a nutritarian diet to take care to prolong their lifespan. Tom Brady, Venus Williams had to leave the tennis tour due to Sjogren syndrome or, or, or in, in connective tissue disease due to an autoimmune disease and got well through following a diet almost exactly like I'm recommending, a new, you know, a nutritarian diet. We're talking about the ability to reverse disease and prolong their careers and age slower to improve their athletic performance, improve their stamina, keep them aging slower so they can compete. But there's a difference between a basketball player, a tennis player, a skier, and a cross and a, and a um, triathlete with a linebacker on a football team and a power lifter trying to achieve size or a sumo wrestler trying to get in, um, artificially large. And I'm saying that um, you can't get artificially large and still have a long life. So you're, you're, you're playing, it's dangerous to get that. So it's, but you can be a great tennis player, a great skier, a great basketball player, and still compete at a high level through, you know, and watching your diet and your sleep and all those things. And look at Eric Schloppy. He was one of the, he was a, in the, he was in four Olympic games in, in the top of his field in downhill skiing. He lived in Park City. He's an American skier who's now retired and has kids. And he traveled with his Vitamix and made green smoothies. And he did so because it would prevent him from being sick and missing an event or, or not being able to train. Because these athletes of today, like Djokovic and Eric and other people who follow nutritarian type diets, they, they don't get sick so they can keep moving and training on. Because if you get sick right during the winter and you're out on your, on your back for a week, your whole career, your whole year's work could be shot. There's only a tenth of a second difference between you and the guy in 50th place. But So the point is, is that they, they, they want to keep well. They want to keep their youthful vigor and vitality and not age rapidly so they have to leave their sports. So it, may, it slows the aging process. It keeps them at their levels of high degree of fitness for many, many more years. Look at Tom Brady today as a perfect example. And look at, look at um, um, you know, um, well, you know, a lot of basketball players we're talking here about, like even LeBron James has made a radical change in his diet. And he's doing really well, you know. Um, but in any case, what I'm saying here, just to clarify, yes, if you're trying to go for excessive size, artificially sized, larger than, and you have to eat more animal products and more calories than what's good for you ideally. And, and people used to take steroids and take things to make themselves artificially get big. You know, I was in the, on the 1972 Olympic team, the East German Olympic team, they're almost all dead. There's very few of them alive today. And wow. those were top athletes and they're all dead because they probably took performance and fancy enhancing drugs when, the, you know, when they were in those years in the, in the communist countries and which, so, so we're not just, so we have to, you know, what's the, what's the term, um, you know, you know, weigh the performance aspects against what's good health for our longevity. Just because a drug makes you have better performance, it may not good for your longevity. And just because animal protein in high amounts may build a little more muscle tissue, doesn't mean it's good for your longevity or your, or the rate at which you're aging. Well, most, most people aren't thinking about longevity until they're older, right? Or yes. dealing with a chronic health condition. Certainly younger people in my generation, I think. I talk to people about longevity, cancer prevention, you know, anti-aging, these kinds of things. And most of them could care less, unfortunately, yeah. uh, until they get sick, until they get really sick. And then, or they have someone really close to them who's been really sick that they had to take care of. And they might be more concerned about it, or they went through their own health challenges like I did, or they got very passionate about health like I did and got really serious about it. But I'd say majority of younger people, unfortunately, uh, are very short-sighted uh, when it comes to their health and are thinking about today, you know, not tomorrow, not 10 years from now, not 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. Oh, I'll never get cancer. I'll never, I'll worry about it when I get there. And then those are the people that, that I see through my companies that we coach and work with. And, you know, unfortunately, these are the people who are 50, 
55, 60, 65, 70 with a stage three or four cancer diagnosis. And all they want is their health back. Right. And for some of them, it's possible. And for others, it's not possible. It just, I mean, I think it's possible for every person, but there's no guarantee is what I should say. I think the possibility of healing or at least improving quality of life and potentially ex uh, extending lifespan when you're dealing with a serious chronic disease at a later stage in life. I think there's tons of possibility there. There's just, there's never guarantee. Right. And that's the challenge. It's and, and so thinking about, so for younger people, Think about longevity, anti-aging, prevention of disease earlier in life would be a smart thing. But I think some people like that linebacker you're talking about, you know, the 29 year old, 350 pound linebacker who's, you know, maybe they are a professional athlete and that's, that's what they love. And that's all they care about. You know, if it reduces 15 years from their life, do they really care? I don't know. I, I probably at that age, they don't care, but when they're 55 dealing with tremendous pain from the disease and all kinds of issues, you know, that's, that's the part that sucks when you watch your own family or somebody who is on their deathbed and for like my grandfathers, both of them actually, um, you know, watch them suffer the last years of their life. It's like, there's, there's no amount of joy in life. I think that is worth the amount of suffering that you can experience in the last few years of your life, uh, yeah. when we don't take care of ourselves. And so you know, Nathan, that's why this subject you're bringing up today is so critically important. Because my message here is that people need to have informed consent. They need to have the right information. It's okay to tell them that for them to smoke cigarettes for 30 years and then get told by their doctor they should quit smoking after they get lung cancer. But it would be better if they were told that the smoking was probably going to cause them some harmful effects if they do that for the next few decades. And that's the problem with these, these people on the internet giving improper, incorrect, and dangerous nutritional information because they're not giving people the ability to make the right choices for themselves. And people have a tendency to want to believe anything that supports their, the things they want to eat or the, their, their, initial, their, their habits, they're already addicted, foods they're already addicted to. So because we have such a large amount of people promoting high animal protein diets or promoting um, other dangerous health messages. People are, they're, they're essentially tricking people, maybe not intentionally, maybe from their own ignorance, but it doesn't change the fact that they're hurting people with bad information. People are accepting what they're saying. And then when they get something bad happening to them, like colon cancer or a heart attack, then that person was damaged. And that person never had the ability to make the choice because they were given wrong information. So I take that wrong information seriously because I think that we, that, and I don't, and I think it should be like you're saying, reading, writing, arithmetic and nutritional science taught in grade school because we teach smoking cessation and, no to, and say no to drugs in grade school. And that's been very effective at reducing smoking and smoking addiction moving forward because we're taught when we're young how bad smoking is. And the same thing is true with, you know, promoting the consumption of candy and sugar and processed grains and commercial baked goods, which are linked to um, not only linked to disease, but linked to depression and linked to drug abuse. Let me say that one more time to be clear on that. I'm saying that the consumption of commercial baked goods and fast foods are linked to depression in a dose dependent manner and, I'm all, and mental illness. And I'm also saying that in the highest quintile of candy, fast food, and commercial baked good consumption as a child, you have a higher risk of having being arrested for a criminal offense or a drug-related offense by the time you're 35 years old. Does it really that these foods are addicting and they and they're disease causing? And it's very important that we give people informed consent and we instruct them properly and not try to trick them into believing that what they're doing is healthy. And that's really important. That's really important. Um, and I think an important message I'm staying about the um, keto, paleo, or carnivore movement, where people aren't just advising animal products in small amounts as a condiment to add extra nutrition. They're advocating diets that are largely, or you could say, based on animal products, which we know at this point in human history that those diets result in harm to this individuals later on in life. 
So you're giving people the wrong information that's going to lead to some problem in their future, unfortunately for those individuals. And the science supports the viewpoint I'm stating right now that we have to give people enough information so that they can make a good decision for their own life. So to be clear, you're not 100% against animal products. You're saying, look, if you have... If you're going to have animal products in your diet, they should be 10% or less. Is that accurate? Um, Yes, that's pretty accurate. But I'd have to say that um, that for some people, even 10% can be too much. That we generally see heart reversal occur in in diets that are below 5%, and we see no heart attacks occurring. In the 10% range, we still see some low flickering of heart attacks. For example, in the seven-day Adventist study, having one serving of meat a week, one serving of meat a week, still significantly increased heart attack risks, even in one serving a week. So a person who has that genetic risk should probably have no, no meat and maybe one serving of fish a week or none. So yes, um, but so in most population studies, 10% or less, we generally see very, um, very good outcomes with very little heart attacks and cancers. So yes, generally speaking, a healthy individual may do okay with 10%, but ideally 5% becomes more assurance, but above 10% is when we see the epidemiologic studies start to see populations showing um, a higher degree of heart attacks and cardiovascular deaths in a dose-dependent manner from 10% to 15% to 20% to 25%. Keeping in mind, the Americans eat about 30, 30 to 35% of calories from animal products. We're eating already a high amount of animal products by worldwide standards. By worldwide standards, we see that in the lowest tertile of animal product consumption, which is below 7%, because the middle range is 15 and the higher range was 30 worldwide, and the lower range below 7%, we saw, um, you could say, um, you know, 70, 70% less cancers than we did in the higher range, above 30%, you know. So let's talk about keto, um, because there is a ton of controversy around the ketogenic diet. And there are doctors that I know um, and published scientists who use ketogenic diet and see incredible results with cancer. And so, and then there are a lot of people who claim they get on a ketogenic diet and their autoimmune disease goes away and this goes away and that goes away. They heal their chronic health conditions. So you see these, you know, people stories all over the internet and doctors promoting it and guiding their patients down keto and saying they are seeing tremendous results and not only short term, but long term as well uh, in, in these cases. So why is it that some people are saying ketogenic diet is healthy? It's good. We're seeing great results. And then you know, you're saying, and the science is saying, no, it's actually not very healthy for you. That's right. I'm saying it's clear that we do have long-term studies today on long-term use of keto diets. And out of the long-term studies on long-term use of keto diets, we're showing poor long-term outcomes. So you can't say that they're showing good long-term results because we do have this, because that's a claim based on an individual's opinion. But when we're looking at the data, let's look at what the data shows. And the data shows that long-term keto diets have um, sh- lifespan shortening effects, that's quite alarming. So we have alarming information on that. And all the studies done on that so far with long-term data shows higher rates of premature mortality due to numerous reasons. But that doesn't mean you're not going to get short-term results from a lot of different ways of dieting. You just have to understand. And with regard to cancer, there's all the only cancers where there's um, some evidence that ketos seems to benefit are brain tumors and Um, and gliomas and stuff like that. There's no evidence that keto diets benefit common cancers like prostate cancer, colon cancer, and breast cancer. Those are the three more common cancers. There's some unusual cancers that may be more glucose sensitive, that severe sugar deprivation may benefit. I've had people with brain tumors follow keto diets that were more plant-based too, for that reason, to keep glycemic load very, very low and glycemic effects to star brain cancers as to try to shrink, to try to slow the progression of brain cancers as well. But there's very little evidence on, there's some studies being done, but, but other than claims being made, when these claims to look are investigated with more detail and more data, the claims are, are very spurry, you know, very poor information and it's very early in the in the science. I'm open to the suggestion that there may be more cancers 
that show that keto diets may help some other cancers. But right now, I haven't seen any favorable data on that, except for with regard to brain tumors. Um, so that, and then people do lose weight and do can control their high blood pressure, their diabetes, you know, and with keto diets, of course, from carbohydrate restricting, but we can get even better results when we use a natural food plant-based diets with more green vegetables, because we can also keep in nuts and greens. We could also keep the glycemic load favorable and get better results without increasing the risk from all the animal protein. So I think there's safer, I also think that you can get just as good results or better results, which I've documented that and produced many studies on the effects of a nutritarian diet, reversing diabetes, reversing heart disease, lowering blood pressure. Matter of fact, one study had 450 people that dropped their systolic blood pressure 26 points, you know, and within six months on a nutritarian diet that beats out any diet. Even the, the, the um, you know, the conventional authorities say the low sodium DASH diet had the best effect at lowering blood pressure because it lowered systolic blood pressure 11 points, but a nutritarian diet hasn't been beat for lowering cholesterol and lowering blood pressure or lowering diabetes for that matter at this point. So even though ketos work, just like smoking cigarettes work, they're not a good long-term plan for that. So I'd have to say that um, we don't have evidence with regard to their long-term safety. And we have significant evidence as to their long-term harms. So there are better ways to skin the cat than, you know, certainly with some people with autoimmune conditions, just cutting out processed carbohydrates and fried foods can make their autoimmune disease getting well. So going on to vegetables and meats could improve their autoimmune condition. But still, we don't want it. We still have to question, does this person have to eat so much meat to do this? Because that may hurt them in some way. So yeah, we have to question all this and look at the best data we have available. So all the studies that I've looked at personally on the ketogenic diet, on the, the benefits of it, all, all kinds of benefits you can find, every one of those studies that I've seen so far have uh, the participants lost weight on the ketogenic diet during the study. And so... The question then becomes, and this is a question that I ask is, is it the weight loss on that short-term study that created all the blood marker benefits? Because you know if you lose weight, right? If you're overweight and you lose weight, um, even if it's a pretty unhealthy diet, but you're losing weight, you can see a tremendous improvement in a lot of blood markers, right? On a lot of, I mean, you might see triglycerides improve. You might see cholesterol improve. You might see blood pressure improve. If you're losing weight, uh, and you're not overweight or you're losing 10, 15, 20 pounds in a six week uh, study or a three month study, some of these are that I've looked at, then the question becomes, is it the weight loss that caused all the improvements or was it the ketogenic diet itself? Well, don't forget there's some big advantages to a keto diet that's legitimate. It's cutting out processed carbohydrates, which are bad for people and cause bad, bad blood parameters. So it's like there's not everything about the keto diet is bad. Being in chronic ketosis may be bad. Having so much animal protein, raising IGF-1 may be bad. But keeping your glycemic load of your diet low and cutting out the processed carbohydrates, which work on the body as a drug, which accelerate aging, is good. So it's not only the weight loss. There are some benefits to keto diets by removing processed foods and high glycemic carbohydrates. So that's a big benefit. But we want, but but I'm saying that all nutritional researchers recommend that that's that you should remove that. We just don't do the other part with excess amounts of animal product loaded onto that good good part. So it's but yes, um, and the main factor here that people are confused about is they think you can be overweight and healthy, and I'm saying there's no such thing as a healthy overweight person because as body fat climbs on the body, your immune system function falls, and your pro-inflammatory um, inflammatory markers go up, produce more free radicals more cytokines and more um, lipokines, more insulin resistance, more estrogen production. In other words, body fat is a serious issue. And people, because they become addicted to the American diet, are in denial. And just about the argument that rejecting the fact that eating too much meat is bad for them, they're also rejecting the fact that being overweight is bad for them too. They're, they want to deny that as well and think that you can be a healthy overweight person and it's, and it's it's more socially acceptable to just accept your fact from being overweight because it's impossible to lose weight and they might as well just be a healthy overweight person. And I'm also sp speaking against that as well because even being 30 pounds overweight increases risk of later, of later life um, infectious related death and of course increases risk of cancer death as well. 
Hey, I just want to pause a second and ask you, are you enjoying this episode so far? Are you getting good value from this content? If so, then I know you're going to absolutely love Healing Life. At healinglife.net, you get exclusive and premier access to hundreds of the top world's doctors, experts, cancer conquerors, and survivors, exclusive interviews that I have done with all these experts and doctors uh, that are not available for free online. They're only available at healinglife.net. So not only do you get access to all of those, but you actually get to speak with these doctors and experts and ask them any question you want about health and healing. And this is available exclusively to Healing Life members. You can try it out for free. Go to healinglife.net and you can start your free trial there. And uh, whether you're interested in learning more about detox or cancer, diet and nutrition and nutritional science, about diabetes, about heart disease, autoimmune disease, anti-aging, longevity, all of these topics are covered in depth and more are continuing to be added at Healing Life. And again, you get to talk to these doctors yourself. So I invite you to set up a free trial at healinglife.net. And I hope to see you over there. Now, let's get back to the show. But if you look at Cosmopolitan and what the mainstream media is telling people, they're saying, literally, here's the cover of Cosmopolitan with an obese woman saying, this is healthy. So here's what we're being told as society, that being significantly overweight is actually healthy. How, how, are, they, how are they even able to claim this? That's the question. Yeah, you know, it has to do with a social norm today because I think it stems from the fact that people having trouble losing weight, they can't lose weight no matter what they do. And don't forget, it's kind of interesting because a woman of 50 years ago eating the same amount of calories with the same amount of exercise compared to a woman today, the woman today is going to be 30 pounds heavier on the same amount of calories. Figure that one out, right? And we know why it's because of endocrine disruptors and exposure toxins in the environment, the chemical the plastics in the, in, the, in the ocean and the food and the, you know, the endocrine disruptors, the exposure to chemicals of people eating the fast food. But what I'm saying as an advocate of a nutritarian diet, that the, the conventional diet is so addicting that people can't comfortably cut back on calories to control their rate, their, their weight. It becomes impossible to do so because their body is so deficient in nutrients and they crave calories. So because it becomes impossible to lose weight and so stressful to do so and take so much and they just gain the weight back anyway, that then people are said, well, I can't lose weight so I might as well accept it because why should I be in constant stress about something I can't change? So then that, I think that's where it stems from this idea of you know healthy at any weight, but I'm saying a different message because my findings over the last four decades have been that when we eat a diet with a, such a high degree of nutritional quality and we give the body sufficient nutrients, the body becomes comfortable with less calories, no longer is driven to overeat calories, feels satisfied with the right amount of calories and loses weight without having to feel they're on a diet with, ex with extreme deprivation because they're naturally comfortable with the right amount of calories when they eat a diet so rich in nutrients and so rich in natural foods. So my that's life, the, my life yeah, is a new, go ahead. No, I was going to say that's why the nutritarian diet and even the keto diet has some advocates because when you're on, because they take away hunger and take away both diets can make people satisfied with less calories. Whereas on an American diet, you just cut back on calories. It doesn't work. So they're giving people lap bands, they're giving them medications, and even the medications don't even result in much weight loss. It still don't, they don't work that well. And then we have this movement to think that you can be healthy at any age, which is totally against science. The science shows that being overweight increases your risk of depression, diabetes, heart attacks, strokes, and cancers and dementia, unquestionably. So my own life is a testament to what you just said a second ago, which is I used to crave, you know, potato chips, fried foods, uh, ice cream, lots of sugar, things like that. I used to just crave it and I'd eat a whole bag of potato chips, right? I'd eat a whole thing of ice cream. Just, it's like I couldn't get enough of it. And then the more that I cleansed, literally cleansed and fasted and changed my diet over the years, cleaned out my body, slowly over time, I stopped craving those things less and less. And once in a while, I might crave a potato chip here and there, or whatever, and, and sometimes I might have some. But it's so rare compared to what it used to be. 
and I just don't get the same craving. I don't get the same satisfaction. And I know what it's doing to my body. And I know that it's not giving me any real nutrition. It's just a it's just a party in my mouth kind of experience, right? And I know what it's doing to my brain. I know it's basically tricking my body to think that uh, I want more and more and more of this. And this is how you get fat, right? You grab a bag of potato chips and you eat the bag of potato chips and all you're getting is processed starch, lot, you know, usually some sugar. Uh, you're getting, you know, ton, lots of oil in there that's been cooked in and tons and tons of calories that do not provide any nutrition to your body whatsoever. And so you're, you're hungry, right? You're still hungry. And then you go and grab the pop tarts or the, the other thing that doesn't have any nutrition at all. And you just keep eating, 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 trying to satisfy this urge because the deeper urge is really your body is saying, look, I need nutrients. That's why I love your term new uh nutrient excellence or nutritional excellence right which is because the body's saying and the brain saying i need nutrients i need vitamins i need minerals i need phytonutrients i need amino acids i need these things and that's that's how you feel satiated you get it from the fiber and from from the nutrients and so your body goes hey you know i have these i don't really need to eat more i'm as an athlete i'm trying to gain weight and it's been very hard the past year i have to I, to gain weight for me as an athlete, I have to eat more than I want to because the way I eat, I get so much fiber and I get so, so many nutrients that it's like I'm not hungry. And so I have to force myself to eat if I want to gain weight as an athlete. And so I know that's, you know, that's not the ideal way for, uh, you know, the, the longevity yeah, blueprint. But the foods I'm eating are, you know, organic, whole food, plant-based, nutrient-dense foods, very little processed foods, right? So the testament is that on that kind of diet, it's like you, it's very hard to gain weight, even if you're trying. And that's been, you know, which is like, if your thing is, I need to lose weight, I want to lose weight. Uh, I want to be healthy. I want to live a long time. I want to prevent disease. Um, you know, I know for sure in my own life, this diet works. Yeah. But trying to get extra large probably is not the greatest idea. But yeah, and, and I'm not trying to get extra large either. I'm trying to add 10 pounds, right? And I'm not, I'm already lean. I'm already, you know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe those 10 pounds isn't, isn't ideal for your longevity. You yeah, know? for longevity, probably not. I mean, longevity in my frame, you know, to live 100, you know, uh, long and healthy is probably, probably under 200 pounds. I mean, because I'm 6'2", so probably 185 is, is yeah. probably pretty good. I could be lean muscle at 185, but you know, for the sport I'm in, which I love, and it gives me so much passion and joy, and I love doing it every single day. I look forward to it. You know, I need a little bit more muscle mass, not a huge power lifter, not a huge, you know, bodybuilder, whatever, but a little more muscle mass to move some more weight, which for me is probably around 215 pounds. So, um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's a, eating healthy is yeah, a was challenge a to get fat. It just doesn't work. Yeah. It reminds me of a um, what you, reminds me of a famous basketball player on the Miami Heat. His name was um, anyway. He's retired now. He left basketball at a weight of like two hundred and forty pounds mm. um, with kidney disease. And I, his diet doctor in Miami contacted me. We worked together to get him on a nutritarian diet. And he got rid of his kidney disease. And he's been running his body at about, you know, about 20 pounds less now than he was at a lean, a lean, thin athlete at 240. He now runs his body at about 220. He's even smaller and leaner to keep his, and with no more kidney disease. You know what I mean? That's they, awesome. For greater, yeah. greater health. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, a very, very famous basketball player. I can't think of his name right now. <laughs> but anyway. Um, yeah, but, well, um, we won't we won't do any name dropping on this podcast right now, so no worries. <laughs> and what I would say was, you know, something unique I want you to consider and want people to consider here is that white flour and oil flood the body with a high concentration of calories that you couldn't get eating natural foods. Too much calories into the bloodstream at one time, and that caloric caloric load overly stimulates caloric measurement, the dopamine centers in the brain that gets stimulated by excess calorie consumption. And people get acclimated to higher calories and the deadening of the dopamine, the dopamine centers in the brain, which become dopamine sensitive now, then you start striving and driving for more calories. And you don't feel, you feel empty when you don't eat more food. 
And these foods like, like white flour and oil, your body can't convert white flour into energy directly because you need, you need cofactors, vitamins and minerals to do so. So it more easily shunts it to fat production. And then when the cow, when you do produce flour into energy, then you're utilizing up reactive oxygen species and vitamins and minerals, causing more nutritional deficits from the, from the utilization of white flour for energy. I'm saying that white flour products like pizza and burgers and bread are act more in the body like a drug and it's an addictive drug leading to overeating behavior. And I'm also suggesting that oil works similar, similarly because Americans get their fat intake, they all do, from animal fats and oils. And us nutritarians get our fat intake from nuts and seeds, walnuts, sesame seeds, pistachio nuts, avocado, flax seeds, chia seeds, right? So when you're getting your fat from nuts and seeds, the calories are absorbed very slowly, a certain amount per minute. And when the calories are coming in, just like getting your carbohydrate from a bean, from your calories are coming in slowly, so your body can preferentially burn those calories for energy as opposed to storing them as fat. And they're not and because they're not spiking the blood with a lot of calories, you're not stimulating the brain consumption to make you addicted to the overconsumption of calories. Americans, they feel empty and wasted when they eat, let's say, 1600 calories a day. The average person, the average American consumes about uh, 3,400 calories a day. And the average rural Chinese person um, consumes about 1600 a day, almost half the amount of calories Americans consume. So it, it, I'm saying most Americans, you know, aren't doing enough physical activity to warrant consuming such high amounts of calories. They're work sitting on their back, their, their buttocks the whole day. But, the, but I'm saying that generally speaking, it's not an exaggeration to say that Americans are eating almost double the calories they need to consume and their diet being so poor in nutrients and so much and so much high glycemic and so much oils, which oil, all kinds of oil is 120 calories a tablespoon and it goes from the lips to the hips in five minutes flat. I'm saying, I make this joke and I say half of what we eat meets our needs and the other half meets the needs of our doctors. So when people say, you know, we can't be eating double. I'm saying, yeah, people eat almost double the calories they need. And the trick is to be able to, to, be able to eat less food without getting too thin. Because we want to maintain good muscle mass and good bone structure. And that we're able to eat till satisfaction, like you're saying, till we eat till we're satisfied and we're not going to feel hungry or deprived and still take and be satisfied with much less calories. That's why when people come to my retreat here in San Diego to learn how to eat this way and stay with us for a few months, they'll lose 25 pounds the first month, you know, 15 pounds the second month. And they'll go home and continue to drop about 10 to 12 pounds a month because they learned and they're not feeling like they're on a diet. They're eating at a buffet. They're taking as much food as they want pretty much. And they go, you know, they're learning to eat the right foods, but they get to be connected instinctually with the right amount, with starting to feel that this is the amount they feel comfortable with, which takes time for people. That's why they come and stay here a while to get rid of their addictive drive to overeat calories. So do you have any, any structure or framework for a percentage of macronutrients that you have found is kind of the ideal percentage breakdown of macronutrients. Now we've been talking about micronutrients and the importance of nutritional excellence and getting a good diversity of these nutrients from, you know, diverse plethora of foods. And we can talk about what kinds of foods those are, but looking at macros, because the ketogenic diet, if you look at macros, it's very high fat and protein and very low carbohydrates. And so people say that's the healthiest and other people say, uh, high carbohydrate is very bad for you. And some people claim a little bit higher fat, a little bit lower carbohydrates. Where is the nutritarian diet on, on that graph, if you will? First of all, the main message here, my main message is to tell people to stop thinking about worrying about macronutrient ratios, because that's going to get you into problems, into trouble, because we have to eat less fat, less carbohydrate, and less protein. We want to eat less food in general and stop thinking you've been trained to think you have to get this much fat, this much protein, this much carbohydrate. And I'm saying if you eat healthy enough, you'll be satisfied with less. And you're, you're getting about um, 40 grams of protein per thousand calories. So let's say you're getting about 30, 40 grams of protein per thousand calories. When you need 2000 calories, if your activity level warrants that, then you're getting about 80 grams of protein. If you're an athlete and you warrant and you warrant three thousand milligrams, when you're warranting three thousand calories a day, then you're getting about 120 grams of protein. 
But I'm saying right now that a diet can be healthy with anywhere from 15% of calories from fat up to 40% of calories from fat. As long as the fat comes from nuts and seeds. If I'm, if I'm a professional basketball player, I got to eat more fat to get, because I'm going to need more calories. I'm going to have more nuts and seeds in my diet. And I was a professional athlete and I did eat a lot of nuts and seeds. I'd have to eat at least six to eight ounces of nuts and seeds a day, which is, what's that? It's 175 an ounce. That's almost um, 1500 calories just from nuts and seeds a day. I had to get the fat content in my diet higher because I otherwise I would have, my stomach would be too full with the foods I had. I needed more concentrated calories. Otherwise, I stretching out my stomach. So I was in class in college, you know, snacking on sunflower seeds while I'm watching, while I'm working in the, my while I'm working in class all day. I had to keep my calories up, and I had to use a concentrated source, but a good source like sunflower seeds, not not olive oil. I'm eating a whole seed with a, with a lot of nutrients and proteins and fibers. But we know from those studies on ketogenic diets that carbohydrate, when carbohydrate intake drops below 30%, then we see significant increase in early life mortality, dropping carbohydrate intake below 30%. Now, I'm also advocating for a low glycemic diet. I don't want people to eat a lot of dried fruit and a lot of processed grains, but the fact that they're eating beans, which are low glycemic and nuts and green vegetables means they're getting a lot of high protein plant foods that are naturally low glycemic. They're not eating, we're not eating a fruit-based diet, even though we're eating six pieces of fruit a day or for three to six pieces of fruit a day for most of us is okay because our diet, we're not eating a fruit-based meal. We're eating a vegetable-based meal. But in any case- So hang on a second. There's, just, a, there's a range just, of acceptable numbers here. Hang on one second. One second. You just said uh, studies have shown carbohydrates below 30% in the diet equals right. what? increases risk of early life death. Now, is this multiple studies? Is this the studies on the ketogenic diet? Is this, what, what studies are these that show this? There's multiple studies now. And I, I, did give a, um, I did give you a list of three of three such studies that were done independently by different researchers showing that they looked at people on lower carbohydrate diet, in, diets in general, some of which were keto diets, who are, you know, other people are just on high animal protein diets, like Atkins type diets in the past that want to keep their, that do advocate ketosis to keep their levels of carbohydrates low. And what they found particularly was the carbohydrate restriction and a degree of carbohydrate restriction was linked to early life deaths. And we think that's maintaining ketosis for many years, for long periods of time is harmful to the body's longevity. Gotcha. So you're saying carbohydrates now on a nutritarian diet, Carbohydrates are automatically going to be above 30% anyway because you're eating beans and vegetables and fruits, which are high in carbohydrates already. Correct. That's correct. So you're not concerned about any real percentage of fat versus carbohydrate versus protein. I know you focus a little bit more on protein specifically because of the studies on plant protein and certain percentages. Right. But we want to have more plant protein and less animal protein. That's the key factor. Not worry about the amounts. But once you're on a completely vegan diet, then we want to pay attention to plant protein to make sure a person is eating greens, nuts, and beans because those foods give you more adequate protein completeness by having them in your diet, even a small amount of beans, even a small amount of nuts and seeds. But we want to, what, what, the other issue here is that green vegetables, we're such a green vegetable dependent animal that our immune system ability to fight cancer and ability to slow aging is so related to green vegetable consumption that green vegetable consumption linked to longevity with no threshold effect, the more you eat, the longer you live. So we're trying to advocate people eat a lot of vegetables, particularly a lot of green vegetables. So what about the people out there saying, the doctors out there specifically saying that things like, uh, you know, cruciferous vegetables, kale, a lot of green vegetables, broccoli have anti-nutrients and that you should actually avoid those kinds of vegetables? Um, that is so ridiculous to be not even worth addressing. Because like I said, we have a thousand different studies show that the consumption of cruciferous vegetables lead to longer lifespan. And they can't produce one study that shows that consumption of vegetables have any um, adverse effects on any factor, longevity, heart attack, cancer, dementia, with not one study to suggest that's true, and thousands showing the opposite, to come up with ridiculous opinions like that by these gurus is just, it's just, it's not, it's, um, it's really sad. And people will believe whatever they want to believe, you know, but there's no data to suggest that's true. The only thing that we see in animals is that if you go to a very high consumption of preserved vegetables, 
it could suppress the thyroid. But it's almost impossible to consume that amount of cruciferous vegetables uh, and if you're eating a varied diet with other foods in it, unless you're juicing huge amounts of it each day. And so the effect, so even the thyroid suppression from the goitrogens in so-called cruciferous vegetables is still not even a valid arg argument, number one. And number two, cruciferous vegetables are the richest source of isothiocyanides, ITCs, which are probably the most powerful anti-cancer substance, which arms the cell's machinery the, um, the ARE, the antioxidant response element in the cell, it removes toxins, repairs broken at DNA crosslinks, and, um, and suppresses genetic alterations that could lead to cancer. So we're talking about foods that lead to gene silencing, clean the body, slow aging. So these, these claims about them having anti-nutrients or negative factors in them, okay, you can make any kind of claim. But today, in today's world, we have good data. We have a lot of science that looks at consumption of these things over time in people, and we show dramatic benefits. The same thing, some people are saying beans. Well, beans have too much lectins in it. Well, then why are beans linked to longevity in every study ever looked at? And the Hispanic effect shows that people, even the um, relatively economically deprived people living in food deserts, who are Hispanic do better than black Americans as far as longevity because they eat some beans in their diet. And whether people eat little beans or whether we're looking at um, the blue zones where people live the longest, eating more beans, we show that beans are linked to longevity and have anti-cancer effects. And the Nurses Health Study also showed that even eating two servings of beans a, a week lowered um, breast cancer rate by 23%. Just two servings of just women who ate two servings of beans a week had a 23% lower risk of developing breast cancer. That's just an example. And so making a claim that beans are bad when every study show they, they promote longevity is just ridiculous. Well, the lectins and beans specifically, we know that lectins from legumes, for example, are primarily mostly eliminated, right? There's a little bit left over, but mostly eliminated when you cook them fully. And I don't know anybody who eats raw beans. I don't think they'd have very many teeth left if they did. Uh, no, raw beans are dangerous. Yeah. And I don't think you would ever try. And I don't know who would ever want to eat raw beans, but um cooking them basically removes majority of the lectins anyway so lectins when when people claim that lectins are bad for you i'm not sure where they're saying it's bad for you in in real life uh, maybe the lectin itself if you're consuming massive amounts of lectins you know we do know that there can be some issues with that but when you're eating you know wholly cooked beans those lectins are primarily removed well the um the thing is, is that there is a risk of eating undercooked beans. So the knowing about lectins is good because then people know not to eat hard beans that are undercooked. They're not intentionally eating raw beans, but they may have served beans that were not cooked sufficiently. And not cooking them sufficiently does place people at risk because undercooked beans with, the, uh, with those type of lectins can cause agglutination of the blood, red blood cells. So we want people to eat beans that are thoroughly cooked. That's a good thing to know, that we should eat beans that are thoroughly cooked. How does, someone know, how does someone know if they're thoroughly cooked, if their beans are thoroughly cooked versus a little undercooked? Because they're not, they're, they're not soft. They're hard enough. They're not hard. They're not chewy. They're soft enough. They, like know. there's a little, like I've had beans before where it's like a little, like they're soft, but it's, there's a little bit of a, I don't want to say crunchiness, but almost like a little bit of a hard, moderately hard shell, right? Where it's like, it doesn't just melt when you chew it. It kind of, if it's crunchy, it's probably been undercooked. Yeah, and it's not quite crunchy. But basically, you want the beans to like, when you chew them, they just immediately kind of like melt, right? Into to be chewed, yes. You do yeah. want to cook the beans. But the lectins that remain in cooked beans have beneficial effect against cancer and beneficial effect on bone mass and are actually good for you of anti-cancer effects. So the small degree of lectins that remain after cooking are actually healthy for you. So there's a, people are very confused about this issue. What about oxalates? It's another big issue. They say oxalates from the vegetables and so forth and beans and all that. That's really bad for you. You got to avoid oxalates. So avoid all of the vegetables and all the beans and all, all the good stuff for you. Oxalates um, cause calcium oxalate crystallization in the urine and can cause kidney stones when your diet is high in animal protein. That is correct, that when you're eating a lot of animal protein, it makes more likelihood that the oxalates in certain vegetables like spinach, Swiss chard, beet tops, and parsley can be more of a contributory factor to kidney stone formation. But when the diet is not excessively high in animal protein, when your diet is what we're saying under 10% of calories from animal protein, then the oxalates do not precipitate out. 
That doesn't mean I'm still not recommending people eat more than 25% of their diet from the high oxalate raw vegetables because because I'm not because raw spinach, raw Swiss chard, raw parsley, and raw um, beet tops, the oxalates bind calcium and you don't get as much calcium absorption as you do from lettuce and kale and collards and other arugula and other green vegetables. So I still don't want people to predominantly eat spinach salads raw because yeah, I want them to eat other types of green vegetables too. So we do have some awareness of oxalates, especially in kidney stone formers, but it's more of an issue with people eating a lot of animal protein. Why, why is that? Why is it only a matter if you're eating animal protein versus eating like a plant-based diet? It's the, because the acidity of the urine um, makes the oxalates crystallize you know, when you acidify the urine from so much acid, an acid forming diet, you know, you have more acid forming urine. There's one, there's some other reasons too, that, you know, as far as pressure in the kidney and increased pressure on the, the you know, the, the parts of the kidney, but um, okay. So going back to what you were saying on kind of the macronutrients, one, if you're eating a more nutritarian style diet, you're, you're getting a lot of diverse food. The, the fat versus carbohydrate versus protein is not that big of a concern. You said 15 to 40% of fat, if it's coming from, you know, whole food fat sources with nuts and seeds and, and things like that. Plus, you know, a lot of, you know, beans and uh, a lot of foods already have some fat in it as well. A lot of plant foods, yeah, carbohydrates. But, but some, by the way, I have some overweight women who I'm not, I'm, they're fat. They're having not more than an ounce and a half of nuts a day, between an ounce and a half to two ounces a day. So their fat may be closer to 15 or 20%, um, just because they need to restrict calories because they have slow metabolic rates. And But but it's not doing it because of the fat issue. But an athlete, of course, eating more nuts could push their their calories up to 40% of calories in fat because they're burning those fat calories off. My diet can be higher in fat because um, my body fat's low, I'm very physically active, and I'm burning off those fat calories. I'm not storing them on my body. And so those extra omega-6 fats are burned off for energy. If I was overweight, then it would be not favorable to have a diet of that much fat. You follow me? Yeah, I have to eat um, over 4,500 calories a day just to maintain my weight at 205. If I want to gain weight, I have to eat more than 4,500 calories a day. Wow. How much? How many ounces of nuts and seeds a day do you, are you eating? So I don't measure, um, but I, you know, I, I'll use chia seeds, I'll use flax seeds, I'll use hemp seeds. Um, I, I put a big hand, not a big handful, but a good handful of pecans in my oats in the morning or walnuts, pecans or walnuts. Um, and that's, I don't eat a ton of nuts and seeds actually. So the big handful and then, and then the chia, uh, flax, or hemp seeds that I put like in my smoothies or in my yeah. oats. And that's usually about when it. I used to, when I used to advise like world-class and Olympic athletes, I used to like, I even sent them bottles of Mediterranean pine nuts mm. because 40% protein. Those are so, so good. Give them, yeah, they're, they're, they're expensive though. Can you send me some? <laughs> Yeah. Awesome. I would send it to them because they were like Olympic and world class. They were top athletes. Hey, I'm working on it. Okay, I'm working on it. That's I'm, okay. I'm headed. So I give them to them for free. You know, I'd send it to them to keep me on the you know on their, on their team. You know what I mean? But <laughs> anyway, so the Mediterranean pineapples, and also we'd have them eat a lot, a lot of um you know dried soybean dishes and at tempeh and edamame and things. But but particularly hemp seeds. We'd also put the hemp seeds in because keep in mind that. Hemp seeds are a high omega-3, high protein nut or seed, whereas wal as walnuts are, but the walnuts are high in omega-3, but they're low in protein, low in protein. But hemp seeds are, so whenever the recipe calls for cashews, we take out half the cashews and put in half hemp seeds. Whenever the cashew calls for pistachio nuts or pecans or, or um, any kind of nut that's not, we take out half the nut because hemp seeds taste so flat, they don't yeah. change the flavor much. You can just take it half the nut and substitute the other half of hemp seeds. And in that case, we increase the omega-3, omega-6 balance, and we increase the protein content just by using more hemp seeds. So so someone like me, an athlete on a whole food plant-based diet, I'm not 100% nutritarian because we do use a little olive oil uh, to cook with sometimes. We do use a little bit of salt. And I know nutritarian, you, you don't use any oil or any salt, right? I don't use any oil. However, I don't think a little bit of oil is a is a bad thing for a person who is has a low body fat and is highly physical active like a professional athlete. I think oil is particularly bad when people are not heavily physically active and, and, and don't have optimal body fats because then it leads to excessive body fat, like, uh, like extra virgin olive oil. Now I'm saying extra virgin olive oil increases risk of breast cancer on an overweight woman because it makes her become more overweight, which increases risk of breast cancer. 
But and if you were working behind a plow eight hours a day, burning 4,000 calories a day, whether you had a little bit of oil in your diet because you're burning off those calories and your body fat's under 15% uh, for a male, then you're, it's not an issue. Like I can, you know, I don't, but I could eat a little bit of oil, but I, but instead I prefer to eat nuts and seeds because they're richer sources of nutrients. Like I could stand up and show you my, um, my six pack because I, it's six. I've seen it. Six, I've seen it by the way, when I was out at your house and seen you, you know, working out and stuff like that. So it's in your what? 68, 69, I'm 70? 69. See, almost I'm 70. 60. Yeah. I'm and 60, and you still have a six pack. That's pretty amazing. And my body fat's pretty low. My body fat's pretty low. So around 11%, you know, 10 or 11% body fat. Um, so what I'm saying is, I'm not saying olive oil is poisonous. Of course, when you cook an oil and you heat it up, right. the heat causes rancidity. So we want people to mostly eat it uncooked. But if you're overweight, it's just too fattening. And, if by, and you got to take calories out of the diet. And by putting those calories that are absorbed so rapidly and stimulant or appetite stimulant, they might be good for an anorexic person or a thin person in a nursing home needing to gain weight or a person who's too thin. But so it's a question of adjusting it to their individual needs, though I'm not saying it's so dangerous for a person who needs the extra calories. I'm saying it's dangerous for a person taking in excess calories who's going to cause them to not to um, stimulate their appetite and interfere with their ability to lose weight. So someone who is like, uh, have more athletic goals, right? And they're on this kind of diet and they want to increase muscle mass, but keep, you know, fat mass low. Um, mm -hmm. Do you recommend that they do higher fat then, a higher amount of fat in the diet uh, versus increasing car? Like if you were to increase protein, fat, carbohydrates, you have to increase all of it to increase weight, obviously. Like say you want to add five or 10 pounds uh, yes. of body weight, but is it better to increase a little bit more fat than, than carbohydrates in that regard? Yes, because the higher fat nuts and seeds are also high in protein. That's why oil wouldn't be good to eat. No one be talking about putting more olive oil in. It's not going to build muscle. You're better off eating sesame seeds and pumpkin seeds and hemp seeds and, and pine nuts because, and, because you're going to get more protein with the fat. So we increase the fat, which makes you um, reach your caloric needs. But because these things have the protein content of meat or they're, they're high in protein, it gives you more protein for muscle building at the same time. That's why it's better for you to have more calories from nuts and seeds and not the oil, even though you're not going to be, you can still burn off the oil, but you're going to get, you're going to be lowering your protein content of your plant-based diet by putting oil in. Because when you're having the whole nuts and seeds, it would have been you, the fat content would have been associated with the pro with higher protein substances. Now, is there a point at which it gets too out of balance where you have too much fat percentage out of your calories where we're entering into that? Okay, now we're heading more towards ketogenic and away from what you're suggesting. Is there like, what's that threshold that people need to be concerned about? Well, here's the thing. I mean, we, we see in modern nutritional science, we're showing that adding a variety of different foods in the diet leads to longer lifespan. So excluding of carbohydrate vegetables shortens lifespan. Even studies on showing that green vegetables, vegetable consumption um, protects against cancer, show that people who eat vegetables and fruit live longer than people who eat vegetables and don't eat fruit. So even the exclusion of fruit is a negative factor because it increases the exposure to different bioflavonoids. So particularly that's where my GBOM acronym has the, um, the berries at the end Green, talking about these anti-cancer food, G bombs, greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. So because each one of these foods and even other foods that aren't on that list, that we wanted to go after nutritional variety, a diet that's vegan and excludes nuts doesn't people don't live as long. If you're excluding fruit, you don't live as long. If you eat too much fruit and exclude all carbohydrate vegetables or beans, you don't live as long. The minute you take a certain factor of food and take it out of the diet, you're lowering the nutritional diversity of your, of your diet and increasing nutritional diversity is one aspect where that increases longevity, increasing nutritional diversity without, without increasing calories. So therefore we want to have some beans in the diet. We want to have some root vegetables in the diet. We want to have some whole grains in the diet. We want to have some nuts and seeds in the diet. So that one, and you want it. So I have a wide range of acceptable dietary styles. I'm saying 15 to 40% of calories of fat is an acceptable range Probably if you're going to 50 or 60 percent of calories from fat, then you're probably not getting enough of the other foods that are that you probably the beans and the grains and the vegetables and the fruit. You're probably not getting enough of the other things you should be eating. It's your diet is probably too imbalanced, you know. Yeah, that makes so that makes perfect sense. 
So <clears throat> the G-bombs is, is easy to remember. Greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, seeds, and berries. Uh, that covers a wide variety and diversity of all kinds of different kinds of food, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind of easy takeaway for people to think about. But the big issue for people when it comes to weight loss or changing their diet to heal cancer or diabetes or heart disease is not so much understanding this stuff. People can listen to this and understand and go, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I need to stop eating potato chips and ice cream and processed foods and, you know, high animal products and whatever. It's how do they actually do it? How do they make it stick? How do they make the changes when these foods are as addictive as as cocaine, right? We know sugar literally is processed sugar on the brain does the same thing as cocaine does. It's incredibly addictive. And so how do you get people to actually make these changes in their life so they can lose the weight, keep it off, feel good, uh, transform their health and not, you know, get stuck in that, that rapid continuous death spiral of, you know, potato chips and donuts. Yeah. We can do that. Another two hour conversation. on that. (laughs) Well, a lot of it's emotional. I mean, there's a big emotional component to this, right? Well, they first have, yes, they have to understand the biological effects of food addiction they have to be they have to know what food addiction is what the symptoms of it are how to get rid of it and then they have to know about emotional overeating and they have to also learn about the fact that they have to change the way they think they think to a degree to not to to not to try to please other people or try to um, behave in a manner to need the approval of other people because you're going to be different if you're eating healthy but one thing i wanted to say that in the way you brought up have people have you know they know they should eat healthy but they can't do it um, I'm proud of the fact that I've developed all these incredible recipes and diet programs that people can do that they find delicious and satisfying. It's funny, I was giving a, con- a presentation at a nutritional research conference where other nutritional researchers from Harvard and around the world were presenting, right? And um, one of the head nutritional researchers from Harvard, I think his name was Frank Yu at, at the Harvard Medical School. He came up to me and said, you've put together the most, how should he say, the most practical application of nutritional science so people could follow it and make it taste good. Because all of us are talking about numbers and nutrients and foods, but you've really put it together in a way to make it applicable to people so they can put it into action into their own kitchens. And I said, well, thanks very much. I really appreciate you saying that because that's what I've been trying to do for most of my life is make people so they're able to do this and make it taste good. Because talking about the research is one thing, but you're saying about eating raw broccoli is good for you, but who wants to sit there and eat a plate of raw broccoli? You know what I mean? A broccoli sprouts. You got to make it so people have a taste, you know, taste good. But anyway, so what I'm saying right now is that there are two things that happens. This one is that when you eat unhealthfully and then you move to a healthy diet and you start restricting those foods that you thought you couldn't live without, you feel physically worse and you feel weak and shaky and fatigued and you go through emotional withdrawal and you can feel some degree of emotional pain or agitation at the same time. It's like exactly how I felt when I quit smoking. You know, right. it's, it's when you have an addiction to something that is both, that is emotional as well as physiological, it sucks at first, you know, yes, at, least, it at least for a short while, it really sucks. And the physical pain goes away usually in the first week, but the emotional longing for those things you're missing continues on for months. The same thing when you stop cigarettes. You might, after six weeks of being off nicotine, you're not suffering anymore, but you still are emotionally addicted to smoking. And that takes longer to leave you. I got to tell you, for me, it was it was three days. And here's why. And I know for some people, it's not that fast. But yeah. I was so, you know, I was smoking at a very young age. I was smoking two packs a day. I mean, I started smoking when I was a very young teenager and got to the point where I was smoking two packs a day. And... I got to the point in my life where I made such a strong decision that I was going to quit cigarettes. Like I had tried so many times before that for years, tried to quit, never successfully tried all the things, the lemon drops and the toothpicks and, you know, all kinds of things. Nothing seemed to work. What worked for me with that was I, I got very serious about getting healthy. And I said, you know, I was 18 years old, 18, 19 years old. And I said, I, I've been very unhealthy for my whole life, basically up to that point, sick, all kinds of health issues, all primarily, you know, self uh, doing it to myself. <laughs> and I made the decision to get healthy, to stop all pharmaceuticals, stop all drugs, cigarettes, everything. And I was going to the gym one day and I, I finished working out and I walked outside and lit up a cigarette. And, and I stood out there and I just thought, what the hell are you doing? 
you're trying to get healthy and you're smoking a cigarette after you work out. Like, are you just so stupid or what? Like I had this real conversation with myself, like how stupid can you be? How is the, how are you going to get healthy and then smoke cigarettes and cause cancer at the same time? Like there, it, it, it was such a dichotomy in my brain. And it was like, if you're serious about this thing, you have to quit cigarettes. And I literally, I went, I made that decision so strong in that moment. I went home and told my roommates, I said, guys, the next few days, I'm going to be a dick. I'm going to just be an asshole. Deal with it. I'm quitting smoking, period. That's all I said. And then the next day, I, I, I quit. But what was crazy was that uh, that afternoon because you have the the physiological response well as the emotional well you know some i mean i had cigarettes with coffee in the morning i had cigarettes with beer i had cigarettes with this cigarettes after every meal right all of these stimulus all of these triggers that make you want to have that thing and it's true with food as well but i was sitting outside where i normally would sit down and smoke and there was an ashtray there with like a little half of a cigarette and my body without my consciousness literally or my subconscious addictive part if you will picked up this half cigarette and started lighting it before i even realized what i was doing and in that moment i go what are you doing and i threw it down and i took the whole thing threw it in the garbage and it was like that was it the next few days sucked i was i had a job interview to get into real estate and i was sweating and I like felt terrible and I was, you know, um, I just, I felt terrible, but it, it took in less than a week, I was done. I was over it and I never wanted or ever desired a cigarette again. And so I'm not saying that's true for, for everybody and probably not true for most people, but I, I think why that was a case for me, why that time that I was able to actually quit and never even think about it ever again, was my decision was so was so strong and I had such a deep reason to do it that there was no going back and there was nothing that could stop me. I didn't count my days. I was like, I'm 30 days cigarette free. It was just, I'm done and that's it. And um, I, I mean, that's my theory anyway. I don't know. Well, you know, obviously, you know, I'm working with people who have food addiction all the time and the primitive brain is missing the high and the stimulation. And the body can think illogically. Now, you know, your brain is not your best friend. The primitive brain, like you'll be in an airport with no food with you. And you'll be smelling this, this you'll be smelling the aroma of the chocolate chip cookies and the bagels and saying to yourself, well, look, I've got no food. I'm not going to starve. So I got to eat something. So I better have a bagel. You know, I better have a pizza or something. There's nothing else to eat. So the addictive brain put themselves in that situation with no food in their backpack and put themselves. If the primitive brain were, you know, is like working as your enemy. So I, and that goes away with time, but it takes months for the person to lose the, for you get back. I'm going to stick on this program, but for a lot of people, when their commitment is not that powerful. Has lost the keys to the bank. In other words, they're not in control of their own behavior anymore. Their brain is not on their friend. Where they're off the cigarettes, where they're off the alcohol, where they're off the sugar, they're off the white flour, off the oil. Flour, off the oil. They got to get. When they're sabotaged, especially when they're sabotaged by not just their environment, but by their friends and family are trying to sabotage them too, because they're surrounded by food addicts. Or, or, or you're going to leave the club of food addicts, you know? So in any case, this can be tough, but we've developed the processes over the years so that people can, you know, read the books, watch the videos, join one of my programs or my online programs, or, and they, they really feel that the information sets them free. They get enough information, they're able to make the right choices and know what to expect, how to break free from their cravings and desires to, to eat foods that are not in their own best interest. The question is, why would a person do something and they're not in their own best interest? Why would you eat candy? Why would you eat hot dogs? Why would you eat potato chips? Why would you do that if it's not in your best interest? And the reason is because they're addictive and they're designed to be addicting. They're made by scientists that dying to hook people. It's just like, what if there was everybody trying to give you a kid cocaine? You know, they're, they're, these things are addictive substances. 
these highly flavored, highly caloric, highly rushing into fast calories that absorb very rapidly are designed by food scientists to hook people and they get people hooked. And you got to get, and you got to get off them to get unhooked. So one of the things I've heard from people often when they, you know, they see how I live and how I, how I eat and they learn, especially other athletes who see how strong I am in the gym and, and they go and they know I'm, you know, plant-based and have been for a long time over a decade. And they're, and at some point conversation always comes up and it's so common. I hear it again, and again, I tried going vegan. I tried going plant-based, but I just couldn't do it. I couldn't, um, I couldn't stick to it. And I say, well, well, why was that? And I start digging in and very often it's just people don't know how to cook healthy food and make it taste delicious. And that's what you were just talking about a yeah. minute ago, which is one, you got to have the, the, the knowledge of what these processed foods and, you know, uh, highly palatable foods and high sugar foods and high animal products are doing to the body. You got to know what it's doing. You got to continuously educate yourself. That's one thing I've done for the past 17 years is continue to educate myself on this exact thing. That's why I read the research papers. That's why I do these interviews. That's why I continue to learn because as much as I learn, I'm still always questioning and trying to learn more. And so you have to keep continuously educate yourself, but then um, you also have to learn how to make it taste good and learn how to do it easy, right? Make it easy. Um, because if it's difficult, if it takes someone an hour and a half to make a simple meal uh, that tastes terrible, they won't, they won't stick with it. For sure. So one of the things, so, so you were talking about your cookbook. I, I love your cookbook. Uh, the eat to the eat to live cookbook. Eat I to think live cookbook. One, that's yeah. the one I have. I have yeah. a few, I have a few cookbooks, but I like the eat to live cookbook the best too. I don't have the other ones. It's the only one I've, I have, I'll have to get some of the other ones, but you know, one of my favorite recipes in there is the, um, the tofu scramble. So the tofu scramble, like, I love that. It's so good. Um, that, you know, there's some simple fast recipes in there. There's some good soups. There's, the, the key is, is getting a good cookbook, a good recipe book that follows true healthy principles, and then learning some of these recipes, experimenting with them, figuring out the ones you like, and then you've got three or four or five recipes that you can cycle from, from time to time, right? Maybe you have 10 over the course of a year or two of doing this where it's like you can cycle through them and, and you can change things pretty easily. My breakfast is pretty simple, but I can change it up depending on which fruits or berries I put in there, which nuts or seeds I put in there. And all those little things, you know, give the diversity and might change things like my oats in the morning, still cut oats. I cook it with some high protein um, almond milk. It's actually what I cook it in. And then I'll add in different kinds of nuts. I'll add in some, um, you know, one of my favorite dried berries is the the golden berry the gooseberry i love those too i love those yeah yeah, yeah the dry they're i mean sour but they're good they're sour and i love the sour actually yeah, i like too. sour <laughs> this morning i had a side berries in with oatmeal and berries but, nice. but you know what i'm thinking i just want to put a plug in for my some of my food products but because a lot of times you make you throw some vegetables in a wok or you open some frozen vegetables and one of my favorite things to do i have this thai curry sauce mm. and it's i can make it from scratch in the vitamix but if I'm in a hurry, I can just open a jar of the Thai curry sauce that we make with no oil and no sugar. It's flavored with a date, sweetened with a date. And you just take a couple of tablespoons of the Thai curry sauce on top of the vegetables and you have an incredible delicious vegetable dish. Or, or you know, you just, so the sauces and the salad dressings make the vegetables jump out at you, you know, and so easy to cook. And I particularly design a line of products to make people who can do this, who don't have any time. They can just open some vegetables and throw some sauces on top or open a salad and put some dressing on top or open a, a thing and open a box of healthy soup and then put it and eat it up. So, you know, so I've developed, you know, um, how should I say the product line to support the recommendations of people that I'm giving people because I know that they have trouble with a time element and learning how to make it taste good. So I, that's what my profession and my career has been to make how I can, how I can supply people and make this easier for them. So they've had no trouble doing it and make it taste delicious. Are these things on uh, like Amazon or places like that? Or are they only on your website? I think there might be on Amazon too, but they're mostly, I think they might, I'm not sure. Maybe also mostly on the website, but we have a whole selection of food sauces and salad dressings and soups that make and, and flavorings that make this easy for people to do. Yeah, drfurman.com and click on shop and then click on food. And I'm looking at all the sauces right now on my computer because they're uh, um, the, the thing that I'm makes, the, the, thing that makes that. the food is the sauce. Like like you yes, can absolutely. you can cook the same kind of simple things 
every day and switch up which vegetables, switch up which greens, switch up. Maybe you got tofu this day, next day you're doing beans, right? Like you can switch those things super simple, but what, yeah, what makes the food is, is the sauce at least. Have you tasted my Thai curry sauce yet? No, I'm looking at it right now. Let me see what's in it. I love curry. I love curry. Curry is like one of my favorite. The Thai flavoring has lemongrass in it. So you got dates, peanuts is all organic by the way which is awesome lime juice coconut shallots ginger garlic red curry powder paprika garlic lime peel lemongrass shallots chili powder turmeric cayenne pepper oh my god that that sounds amazing (laughs) yeah and then you can just like what i do with this is like i'll cook up i'll cook up a batch of tofu uh some mixed vegetables and some some brown rice or some quinoa right like that's kind of one of my staples and then just change the sauces on it and change that up. And then we'll do like some curry dishes as well. Um, and do, you know, might be peas, might throw some peas in there or some, uh, I like to do, uh, for my kind of grain, which is not really grain. It's a seed, you know, quinoa. I like to keep that as my, my core base. Sometimes I'll do brown rice and sometimes I'll do white rice, uh, just to switch it up. But I know rice is kind of an issue because of the arsenic. Right. Yeah, the mm-hmm. arsenic and brown rice and the glycemic effect of white rice. But I, I want quinoa as my favorite grain as well because it's actually richer in protein and lower glycemic and cleaner too. It's a clean grain. It doesn't have much chemicals in it. Exactly. And so that's, that's an easy, and it's easy to cook and it's nice and fluffy and it's really tasty. It's got like a nutty, natural nutty kind of flavor. I love quinoa. Um, so I'm going to, I'm actually going to order some of these sauces, by the way, they look. Oh, really can good. I make a recommendation for you? Yeah. Get my bag of wild forest mushrooms Okay. They're incredible. We, they're, they're not commercially grown and you know, they come dried and you can plop them in a soup and they're so anti, they have such powerful anti-cancer and really powerful effects. But it's, you know, I have the mushroom powders and mushroom supplements, but this is just the real dried mushrooms that people got wild in the woods, like black forest and black trumpets and all these things. And they're just like chop them up and drop them into a soup. They're fantastic. Got to try that too. Do, do you go pick them yourself? No, this t- this company in Oregon that I found does it. They go and they they have a whole company that just gets wild mushrooms and dehydrates them. It's phenomenal, you know. Oh, I like your I like your dressing salad dressing variety pack because one of the things too is like making salads taste good. To me, salads are boring to eat. Like I I prefer to take all my greens and veggies and stuff and put them in a blender and just drink it because like I think for me it's the time part. You know, I'm so busy with training in the morning and then working all day, training in the evening, spending time with the family. If we're not doing that, we're traveling. Like, I'm so busy, like, to sit down and spend, you know, 15 minutes eating a salad. I I just prefer, even though it's fantastic for you. And, you know, to get the sauces right, too, is sometimes a challenge if I'm going quick. So, like, I'll just put it in a blender and drink it. But if I've got a good sauce on hand that I can just pour on it, like, that tastes good, that's healthy then I'm way more likely to actually sit down and eat a salad and enjoy it. Definitely. You're going to do it. This good salad dressing is the key. It's the most important recipe to learn is some great taste, like salad dressings and tomato sauces and things. But of course I'm saying that chewing the salad and mixing it with the bacteria in your right. teeth and saliva increases nitric oxide production, which increases immune function, relaxation of blood vessels and physical and athletic performance. You'll get more athletic performance when you actually chew the salad. So even though it's good to do it, Blended, it's also better to do it. So you also add a chewed one too, at least a few times a week in there. That's why we have these nice flat teeth specifically for chewing, chewing plants, chewing, breaking down roots, breaking down, you know, yeah. And when, when we know that when these plants, uh, the enzymes uh, interact with, with our body, right? Our body actually starts a entire chemical cascade process of, all right, here's the food. Here's what we need to do. Here's what's coming in, right? It starts to actually activate and, and certain enzymes mixing together create certain, you know, effects on the body. It's actually really fascinating that by chewing into these plants, we start to activate a incredible response in the body that is designed to heal and repair and rejuvenate. Right. And there are two enzymes I want people to know that are most important here. And the one enzyme is called myrosinase, M-Y, my ro, R-O, S-I-N-A-S-E, myrosinase, which is found in green vegetables, green cruciferous vegetables, that 
um, is in the cell wall. And the better you chew in your mouth, the more myrosinase gets broken open from the packets they're in. And you form more of the anti-cancer compounds in your mouth. You form them in the mouth to the proportion how well you chew. And that's the myrosinase. And it's heat sensitive. So if you cook the vegetable first, you're not going to get the anti-cancer effects. The other enzyme is called allianase, A-L-L-I-I-N-A-S-E. Two L's and two I's. You get triple points in Scrabble, allianase. And that's in leeks and onions and scallions and shallots in the onion family. And that's why people cut an onion, their eyes tear forming sulfenic acid. Because when the sulfenic acid is formed, you're gonna form a lot of other anti-cancer compounds, organyl sulfide compounds. So the trick here, the, what you have to remember, remember two things is one is you're putting raw scallion, raw onion in your salad and chewing them real well. And number two, you're putting raw greens like a raw cruciferous greens and chewing it real well. And number two, when you're making your soups, you cold blend these substances. You don't, you don't put the whole onion in the soup. You don't put the whole greens in the soup. You blend them in the blender so you don't let the heat deactivate the enzyme. And then once you form the compound, the enzyme forms, then you can put the onion in the soup. Then you can put the green vegetables in the soup to cook because you would have formed the ITCs and the organosulfide compounds before you deactivate the enzymes. So it's important that people know those two enzymes and how to cook to maintain the benefits of that for their powerful anti-cancer effects. So I want to switch gears a little bit and ask you about gene editing. There's a whole new thing. I don't know. Have you looked into gene editing? All of you heard the science on that and what, what people are doing with it? Uh, maybe not so much, but I know a lot about gene silencing and the effects of these foods and able to silence defective DNA, DNA that could lead to disease. The body has the ability through a, through a healthy diet, through a consumption of green vegetables and the, other, and the onions and mushrooms to silence genes that could normally cause a problem. And I know that we're able to affect the way that we are. Our genes are the product of what we eat. What we eat forms our genes. Rather than people think our genes form us, is actually our diets create how our genes work. And through epigenetic defects and through epigenetic changes and methylation, methylation of genes, we can cause methylation defects or methylation repair. So the, the genes are active. They're not fixed and we could modify them favorably by the favorable changes to our diet. So we're talking about gene expression right there, which is, you know, foods that can literally impact gene expression in a positive or negative way, right? Which is to say, let's say, for example, you have the, you know, this is the best example I can give is a BRCA1 gene, the BRCA1 gene, the breast cancer gene, right? Which is people say, oh, I have this breast cancer gene. I'm most, I'm going to get cancer. And the reality is, no. Over ha at least half of women who have the gene never get cancer. So it's not the gene, right? It's the environment in which the gene lives and yes. foods and diet and lifestyle and all these things can actually affect the expression of that gene, whether that gene actually activates and turns in, you know, creates the, the, the cancer process in the body or not. And foods can suppress that. So can lifestyle, so can stress, so can many other things. But uh, certain foods can also uh, instigate that, right? Can activate it. Yes, for sure. But the gene editing thing, so one, that's fascinating. That's worth a whole other two-hour conversation. But the, the gene editing thing is I don't know enough about it yet, but I'm, I'm concerned about it, where they're literally talking about going into, they're, they're talking about scientifically manipulating and editing your genes using a... a scientific process to turn these genes on or off basically that's how i understand mm -hmm. it genome editing is basically genetic engineering of the human right. and sounds like I, science fiction it sounds like science fiction and they're doing it they're doing it do you know much about it or no i don't i don't i know that there are a few aspects i'm doing for longevity one is like to take nad per precursors nad plus even I get an, like an IV NAD because there's anti effects on stabilizing brain memory. And the other thing is I pay attention to the omega-3 index that as we're on plant-based diets or any kind of diet, that having an unfavorable omega-3 index has negative effects on brain chemistry and resistance to toxins in the brain, increasing risk of dementia, Parkinson's later on in life. So we want the omega-3 index to be favorable. So I measure that in the blood. I measure the omega-3 index, making sure it's above five at a minimum, at least above five. And a lot of people on plant-based diets or vegan diets, because they're not eating fish and things, have low omega-3 index that could be negative to their brain health and in future life. So I'm very cognizant of possible 
um, you could say, um, at the Achilles heel of a plant-based diet is people not having an adequate omega-3 index. So we use for vegans, we have a vegan um, supplement and I have, and I actually produce in glass bottles a, a vegan DHA and EPA that's kept under refrigeration. So people have fresh, a fresh supplement with no rancidity caused by sitting at room temperature. So people can make sure they take the amount that, that brings their omega-3 index into a favorable range. That said, too much fish oil can push it the other way. So we're saying that too much fish oil can be a pro-inflammatory substance, but too little can also be pro-inflammatory. There is a sweet spot for many nutrients to make sure it's not too low and not too little. And I'm advocating between six and eight on the omega-3 index test or between five and a half and eight as being the optimal range on that test. And that's, and, from, that's from an algae source, right? Yes, it's an algae source. That's correct. Because now, my, I've been in practice taking care of the vegan community of elderly people for so many decades, seeing that the problems they can develop, if their omega-3 index is too low, they can develop neurologic problems as they get older, when they're not going to have a heart attack and not going to get cancer, they're going to live to be 85 to 100 years old. We, don't want, we want them to have the full mental faculties in place and not get demented and certainly not get Parkinson's disease. Now, now kelp are a type of algae, right? Kelp is a seaweed. Yeah, yeah, which I think is a type of iron iodine. Right. And so what's funny about this too is so we people take fish oil uh, to yeah. increase omega threes. But what yeah. do the fish eat to increase their own omega threes? Well, they eat the algae, right? <laughs> they eat the seaweeds, they eat the kelp, they eat the, the plants that make their own omega threes. So it's like, why don't we just go to the source? which is well, well, a lot of people think that we could just eat flax seeds and walnuts and green vegetables, and we could make sufficient D EPA and DHA ourselves. Like the animals can make it. We don't have to supplement. We just eat the right precursors to it, get enough flax seeds. We'll make enough EPA and DHA, but the facts are it doesn't work for most people. They don't have enough conversion enzyme activity to make enough, even if they increase the levels of omega, of short chain omega-3. So they, so some animals may be able to convert it and some people may be able to convert it more readily to produce higher levels. I know a guy who's eating, who takes no supplements and his omega-3 index is eight and he takes no or seven or eight and he takes no omega-3 supplements. He just converts it naturally, you know what I mean? But That's there are other people that have a, would have a level of two because they don't convert at all. So we can't assume what's good for one person is not all of a sudden we have to measure that to make sure that you're converting. And even, so even with dietary gymnastics, some people don't improve their levels and other people can. So I just want to make that clear. But, but algae is the, is, is the one source that you don't need to convert because it already has the Yes. The DHA, well, this right? is especially, it's a special type of algae that yeah. produces EPA and DHA. Not all seaweed or algae would have that. But yes, I mean. Um, well, I'm asking because um, I was watching a documentary the other day on, the, it's theorized of the, um, indigenous tribes that traveled around uh, up where Alaska is now and then down through into the United States, around the ocean, into like Mexico area. There was a whole documentary done on it on where they thought where it used to be frozen there. I mean, this is like 20 something thousand plus years ago where it was actually, they believe it was melted enough through the streams where they could travel along the ocean coast and along certain rivers and things like that. And the things that they theorized that they would have actually been eating most of the thing that would have been most abundant and, and accessible would be things like seaweed and kelp and algae and these kinds of things. Right. Um, obviously fish also, they could have been fishing, but um, that's a common thing for certain tribes. Even today, from what I understand is they do harvest and eat seaweeds and kelps and, and algae um, as part of their normal diet, which is not normal for us here in the West. Anyway, it's never been normal in my life. I mean, other than seaweed in Japan, seaweed is very common, right? Um, if you eat sushi, you're eating seaweed. Um, but here in the West, it's just not a common part of most people's diets. Yeah. You know, humans can survive on almost anything and, and still have a, you know, relatively, um, you know, 40, 50 years of life. But if we're trying to push the envelope of human longevity, and I'm saying we can get to be 97 to 107 years old, then we have to 
use science to try to get there. So yes, we could have past humans have survived on any combination of food, but that doesn't mean because people have survived on it and, and civilizations have lived on those things doesn't mean it's the ideal diet in today's world to live a long life. We've got to be careful with extrapolating that. I'm just saying that, yes, there are different, like, the you know, so um, lots of different ways people can survive and lots of different diet styles human can survive. But the question is, in today's polluted world, with the science we have available today, how can we maximize our chances to have healthy life and to live a long time and not get sick? So we have a, a lot of that to answer today and people don't have, really have to be confused. We've got a lot of the data is really solid. Well, thank you so much, Joel, for taking the time to be here. Um, Eat for Life is the book. Uh, I think anyone tuning in who wants to dive deeper into this world of nutritional excellence, uh, eat for life, go grab that book. And the cookbook that I use that I recommend is the eat to live cookbook. One of my favorites. Um, I'll have to get some of your other cookbooks and try those out as well. So I can't speak to the other ones, but I'm sure they're great as well. And Dr. Furman.com, uh, all of his resources are there. Joel, thanks so much. It was, uh, man, I could talk to you for hours. Um, we got, we got to do this again in the future where we get to go deep like this. This was awesome. So thank you so much. Terrific, mate. Good talking to you. Good All luck, right. everybody. To your best of health. Take care. See ya. All right. Thanks for listening to the Nathan Crane Podcast. If you found value in today's podcast, please share it with others. Subscribe to catch future episodes and leave a rating and a review. For more information or to connect with Nathan, check him out online at www.nathancrane.com and follow him on Facebook and YouTube at Nathan Crane. Until next time, this has been the Nathan Crane Podcast.